and it, it started on a seven pages as a short story, correct? That's true, yeah. It was actually nine and a half years ago. Um, in 2015, Erica wrote a short film version of this. It was called Lorelei. Um, and that's something that's so common. I hear so many filmmakers say that. It's a really good practice to just get a story off of your chest. Um, it was born from a desire to want to explore more grounded and gritty, layered female characters on screen. I think that's what drew Andrea to the project, is just putting women at the center of a film and letting them, allowing them to really take up space on screen and to just be and exist. And this film obviously explores a lot of weighty issues and it's set in the American South in that way, but um, as a short film, it was just the two sisters dealing with the miscarriage. And when we toured it around a few festivals just in the Southeast region, people really connected with these, these sisters and they kept asking us, when are you gonna make it a feature? What happens next? Um, so we were kind of pushed into it by the audience and it wasn't until we attached Andrea to the project and my co-star Hayden, who plays Alex, the antagonist, that we really felt like it was possible to create a feature film, um, and this was our first as a, as a production company. So um, a, a really long journey to get here, but something that has been a joy and a lot of hard work along the way. Like, what should we do during COVID? Let's figure out how to make a feature film. Basically, we did a I, lot of research. I remember you on the phone or the Zoom or something, and Andrea heard we had a script and she says, what do you need? How can I help? Do you need financing? Do you need, you know, help with the budget? Like, let's get this off the ground and just jumped in wholeheartedly. All of us kind of navigating it together without anyone having more experience than the other. I think it was like a beautiful partnership right from the start. And really the impetus of the momentum was having an accountability of partner. Andrea was in Denver and we were in North Carolina. So that's what? 2,000 miles away in um, across America, you know? She's like up in the mountains, the Mile High City, and we're on the coast, but we would, she'd wake up at like five in the morning so we could make 9 a.m. meetings together for about two years before we went into production. Um, we, were, we were producing from other sides of the country and getting things. The, the whole production is 70% women? How, was that by choice or it just happened? I'd say a little bit of both. It's very much a community family movie. When, it's, when the credits just rolled, I was just reminded of all the people that are our kinfolk that we named it. Um, but 70% female and non-binary um, crew and cast and financers. Yeah, it was very intentional. Um, our production company is called Honeyhead Films, and it was founded to create more opportunities for women, both in front of and behind the lens. And every project that we work on is at least 50% women. If not more, if we can always do more, we will. But it's kind of like what gets the green light is having that diversity and that um, voice is really important to us, especially in non-traditional roles like you know, our grip and electric department, our best boy grip was a girl, our best boy grip was a girl, you know? Uh, all of our producers, writer, director, financier, um, and the female-driven story, I think, is also what drew those women to want to be a part of this. Um, as we were crewing the movie, we were also really passionate about giving people their shot. It being our first debut feature as producers, we took a chance on a lot of people and hired on potential over proof. Um, and every department head was their first feature as well. So that's something we're really extremely proud of. And everyone has ownership over this movie because of that. It's not just our film. You know, they're cheering us on from the US and very excited uh, that it's made, made it this far because it really is a, a pretty small film. About the way the rest of the world perceives Southern America or Southern cities in America versus the, the cities we all know, New York, LA, et cetera, Hollywood, and <laughs> all the glamorous parts. So um, why did you choose this location? Do you want to kick it off since you're not actually from the South? I think it's interesting, your perspective. Yeah, I lived in North Carolina for a little while, but I've never been to Wilmington, so I was producing uh, and working on locations from afar. Um, 
I'm actually really eager to talk about some of our challenges with locations, but I will say, like we were talking about earlier, the locations are very much characters in the film, and, and each one of them was so specially chosen um, for all that it offered, and it, and it had its challenges, but it was just so important. Um, and I think if you want to share about why we, why we chose to portray the South and Southern characters in a, in a true and authentic way. Absolutely, yeah. I, I grew up um, here, basically, and this is my home and my America. And I've been so eager to bring this film to Europe to hear from audience members, you know, what, what is your perspective now? Has it changed? Because when I was growing up as a young girl and wanting to be an actress, I never saw myself that looked like my parents or you know my neighbors next door it was always New York City or Los Angeles I went to school in New York City I studied acting at New Strasburg and it's an international school so I was like one of three or four Americans in my class everyone thought New York was just what it was like the whole rest of the country is like that and I used to beg them come home with me for Thanksgiving like meet my family <laughs> feel the real America because it's so different um, than what we usually traditionally see and that was something we were really passionate about breaking out of the tropes um, like the redneck of it all you know the Daisy Dukes and all of the the kind of southern people as a service to like some kind of comedic plot or making fun of these people in these regions that are often just overlooked in cinema we don't we don't see impoverished people um, just living and existing you know the plot isn't an action movie right it's it's very still um, there's a lot of breath um, and moments of silence but that's intentional because not everyone's life is that exciting, you know, and their dreams are still important, and I think it's universal, the themes, um, and I'm just, I'm so curious, you know, you you being in New York and originally not from there either, it's it's so fascinating, right? It's just like a totally different culture. Oh, it is. I actually had to learn a lot about it. I had no idea. Because <laughs> normally you think, as a woman, if your father is abusive, you're going to end up with someone like him. Um, and in ways, that's what happened, and she's emulating her mother and finding that in Alex. Um, I think Erica really felt passionately about seeing the familial ties between these three sis or these three women and their family, and how love can transcend, but it can be just so bitter at times. And that's truth, and that's reality. You don't always love your parents. Um, Profusively, you know, and they don't, they're not always kind to you, but at the root of it, you're still mourning the loss, you know. Um, they're not perfect, and these sisters are not perfect, but at the end of all of it, it's like that forgiveness and that, um, that bond together is what it's really a sister story, you know, it's hopeful. I was just gonna say, it started as a sister story, and sisters don't, they're not always best friends and get along, so the conflict and how they deal with one another, I think, is really genuine as well and nice to see. Well, they hardly knew each other, sort of. No, she didn't have her phone number. <laughs> it had been five years, right? So they'd grown apart and that, that, you know, the interesting intricacies of them reuniting as adults for the first time and then putting to bed all of that toxic energy that divided them, really, and overcoming that is, is what I love about the movie. Um, I'd also want to shout out Mackenzie, my co-star who plays Janelle, has never been in a film before. This is her first time. Um, she is amazing. I think on Rotten Tomatoes, you know, the critics love her. They say, you know a Janelle. I know a Janelle. She is every woman in this way. She just brought so much of herself to the character. Also, the, the boy, Jaden, who plays Noah, the young child, never acted before. He was excellent. Amazing, was right? Really we, we cast um, from our community, and it was really important for all of us to find authentic accents and for these people to feel real. We, we didn't want tropes on, on camera, so we took a chance on a lot of cast, and it was a really fun experience, I think, as part of what brought so much energy to set, there was like no pretension at all, no trailers, you know, I mean, we're, we're like casting the picture cars, we're doing every gritty thing you would imagine as producers, I'm like in wardrobe, like out there, you know, the water spigot's broken, Andrea's like off with a snake in the field, there's, there's just so much 
physical work that went into this, but all of those cast members, they had no expectation. So it's not, it wasn't stressful. Like we had, you know, they call it an actor to worry about, uh, which I appreciated on our first time out for sure. It was really difficult for him because he, he had a lot of reflecting and thinking about how different he is from this character and how to play it. And I don't know, I remember seeing, I remember watching him just go through that creative process and, and, and struggle at times, um, but he was very much affected by the character. Would you be curious to hear what our yes, audience members have to say? Because <laughs> he agreed yes. on the yeah. different perceptions. Our horse car. mentioned accidentally knocked the spigot, which was our only water source in a very far out location, and so the water turned on. So now we have no water in the bathroom. Uh, fortunately, we have a porta potty, but just, you know, every day brought like really interesting challenges. We, we, I think four days in, lost our caterer, got COVID. To hear from you. Yeah, let's open the... I was mesmerized by your work. It's so beautiful. For a long time, I haven't seen such an intelligent approach uh, to the story, the whole thing. How you dealt with the concept of time? There are some flashbacks here and there, but not so much. Today's cinema is more like a TikTok. They immediately want a success and action here. Uh, this effect and that effect that's finished. Uh, beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd love to explain a bit um, how we found those flashbacks. I think it's an interesting um, story. Andrea and I were very heavily involved in post-production. We wrapped the film in July and Blitz through post. We finished um, editing the film and finished sound uh, very early December to get into our first festivals. And we did test audiences. Um, we did a test screening both virtually and then in person. And through feedback from those audiences, we found that they wanted to know more about the past. This film is, um, you know, like he said, exploring a relationship that took place over years and the words weren't on screen and we didn't film it that way. Um, those flashbacks were actually from a proof of concept trailer that we created to finance the movie. So a three minute piece that we made in the fall of 2020. And it was this kind of like last ditch discovery where we said, what if we put flashes that are just like a memory, you know? The that, but that was a beautiful discovery in post, um, and those kind of things happen, and they're magical. I um, I appreciate everything that you said, and the script was even longer. Uh, so just a fun fact: there are many scenes that made the cutting room floor, even characters that just didn't feel necessary during the final edit. It was like if we didn't need it let the silence speak. We know we want our audiences to feel smart, to feel intelligent, and that's something that's a compliment we get often, is thank you for allowing me to feel smart and not spoon-feeding me any kind of ex um, expositional dialogue or, you know, you get it, you get it, and that's the beauty of it. That's Erica's writing, and that's her style as a filmmaker, and one of my favorite things about the movie, I mean, why I love the script so much, it just allows you as a performer to, to play and to be in those moments. And um, on set, it was very respectful too. You know, those moments of silence, our, our crew really partook in that, the reverence that it takes. I, I think I cried every day in every, you know, like once a day at least, because it's a very emotional film for Cheyenne. I remember, having like a wrap on Cheyenne's tears and I got to actually have fun the last like two days of production, but it's a really heavy movie, you know? And so that was important for us that it can breathe like that mm -hmm. and that we could breathe during production too. I'm somewhat related, just I, I guess you reminded me uh, just being fearless in the edit, right? And being willing to cut and let go of things. I think that's something we all learned a good deal. We weren't intentional about but we realized, oh, no, we need to do that, challenge yeah. ourselves, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? You said you learned to play the guitar for the film. Um, uh, what was the motorcycle scene like? Is that like a fake motorcycle? Is that a real, like it looked 
it looked real, but it's definitely real. Um, oh. I was fortunate enough that both of my brothers, Jesse and Wyatt, um, play guitar one, and the other rides a motorcycle, and they were my tutors, and they taught me to do both things for the movie. Um, while we're producing the film, I'm like, I'm stepping away to go learn my lines and learn how to ride a bike and learn how to play guitar. Uh, so that was like a three month process was getting on, you know, going around like the parking lot first and then the neighborhood. And when we did go shoot um, out on location, we had the road shut down by the local police and uh, my friend Evie stood in for me. So he rode the bike so the camera car could, you know, practice. But um, that was like so thrilling for me and something I was when I read it in the script, I said, oh, okay, we're doing this. Erica put it in there, I'm down for the challenge. And it was something that um, was just really fun to do, fun to learn, and I, I feel like a badass when I watch that. <laughs> I can't ride a bike anymore. That was two years ago and I already forgot how to do it, but I, I you know, it probably would come back to you. But Absolutely, yeah, you look very confident in that you. bike. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you, ladies, so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you so much for being here. Thank you.